Welcome to this CTSnet interview. My name's Joel Dunning and I'm delighted to be here at the STS 2018 uh, with Professor Raja Flores, Professor of Thoracic Surgery at Mount Sinai uh, Hospital. Uh, thank you very much for coming to talk to us. Um, not a lot of people might know that actually you, you had some quite a hard beginning. You actually grew up in the meatpacking district. You, you had jobs such as, uh, as sort of doorman and loading trucks. And you, in fact, you know, when you were growing up, you saw people stabbed in front of you. But, but from that, um, you got a scholarship to Einstein College. Uh, you've worked in Columbia, Presbyterian, Brigham and then Harvard. And now uh, you're one of the leading people in the world on the subject of mesothelioma. You've also written extensively about vatsalibate to me and an outstanding esophageal surgeon as well. So it's actually my pleasure to have you here. And I've got just so Thank many privilege. questions that, uh, that I would love to, to know. And so perhaps if we start with mesothelioma, um, there's so much to cover on it, but you know, what do you think is the most pressing issue today about mesothelioma treatment worldwide? Well, I think everybody gets focused on the treatment for mesothelioma, but the most important thing with mesothelioma is prevention. Asbestos is ubiquitous. It's in most buildings in New York City. It was put at a time when uh, everyone used it to prevent uh, fire hazards. Uh, it was in the World Trade Center. And the single most important thing in treating mesothelioma is preventing mesothelioma. Mm. I mean, that, that's quite shocking. <clears throat> I was really surprised then you're telling me that it's not actually banned in America at all. No, uh, asbestos is not banned in the United States. I had been practicing for about 25 years taking care of mesothelioma patients and not until about five years ago did I realize asbestos is not banned in the United States. There are so many special interests involved that try to prevent it from being banned. It's unreal. Many years ago, the heads of big asbestos were in the EPA they were in charge of making sure that they took care of the people, but what they were in essence doing was taking care of their own financial interests. And we still have that today in the fact that mesothelioma, in the fact that asbestos is not banned in the United States. And do you think that could change? Do you think the current government's gonna change that thing or not? Well, I don't think the current government is gonna change it. I think Obama was moving in that direction. Donald Trump, as you know, is a big, property owner in New York City. Most of those buildings have asbestos in it. If the laws change, he loses a lot of money. Once someone knows that asbestos is in a building, it goes, the property value goes down. It costs a lot of money to abate. But the people who are at most at risk are the people who protect us, like the firemen. When they go in there for even the smallest fire, there was just a fire in Trump Tower. And the firemen went up there and they have to tear down walls, etc. The asbestos goes right on them. So we are putting our heroes at risk by not taking care of this problem. Yeah, oh my God, it's an absolute scandal, isn't it? Unbelievable. Yeah. So, so, I mean, we probably need to do something as a society to do that. But yeah, I just don't think it's going to stop while he is president. I think when the next president comes, that should be high on the list because that is really taking care of the people. Yeah. So I suppose if we take, let's talk about treatment, mm -hmm. uh, about things that we can can affect. Let's. Um, I'd be very interested to know. I'm in quite a high asbestos area in, in the UK. You know, if somebody comes to you, you know, 60 years old, epithelioid mesothelioma, relatively contained. You know, what is the best you can do for that person? I'm talking all treatments. What would you be offering them? You know, mesothelioma is very difficult to treat, which is why I stress prevention is the only way to really affect survival. Um, as far as patients who present with mesothelioma. As surgeons, we're biased. We feel that surgery is the best way to treat these patients, but there's an equal argument on the opposite side that you shouldn't do surgery and that they're gonna live as long as they're gonna live regardless of what you're gonna do. I don't agree with that based on the studies that we've done, based on the studies uh, that are out there in the literature and based on my own personal experiences with patients. My longest survivors are the ones who have undergone surgery. Um, as far as pleurectomy decortication versus extra pleural pneumonectomy, that debate has been going on for decades. I do feel that we have come to a point where universally people agree that a pleurectomy, if possible, is better for the patient. When the cancer comes back, which it will with mesothelioma, whether it comes back in a year or whether it comes back 10 years from now, mesothelioma likes to come back in the contralateral lung and in the abdomen. If you remove that lung 
and it comes back in the other lung, you've mm -hmm. painted that patient into a corner. They have no reserve. So the goal is not to get rid of as much cancer that you can see. The goal is to make sure that they survive as long as possible. And every time that you can preserve that lung, that's in the patient's best interest. Now, there are cases where I go in and I realize the lung is destroyed. If I leave that lung in, I'm leaving tumor behind and I will go ahead with an extra pleural pneumonectomy. But my philosophy is different now compared to 15 years ago when I finished my residency. Back then, everyone got an extra pleural pneumonectomy. Now, I'm very selective on who gets that operation and the majority of the times I try and do a pleurectomy. And what are the difficult steps in that pleurectomy? What are the things that you think some surgeons, you know, struggle to do or realize are difficult? Patience. That's the main thing with, pl with pleurectomy decortication. With an extra pleural pneumonectomy, you get in there, boom, 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 it's out. With a pleurectomy decortication, many times you're dissecting and you realize, wow, this is difficult. Then you go someplace else. Then you go back to that spot that you had a little trouble. Next thing you know, it's actually moving again. So it's just a lot of patients with doing a pleurectomy decortication. It's more tedious. It's not as fun an operation from the surgeon's standpoint, but it's better for the patient. Great. Yeah, that's great advice. And then adding something like uh, uh, heated intrathoracic chemotherapy, you know, is that a research tool or is that a valuable adjunct? Now you'll hear my own bias. Uh, it's something that I worked on 15 years ago when I was a resident. If I thought it really worked, I would be doing it today in my own institution. Unfortunately, in medicine, which is big business, there's a lot of outside factors that go into medicine. Uh, heated intraoperative chemotherapy sounds interesting. It's something that draws patients. And I think as physicians, we're constantly bat battling what are we doing for our patients or what are we doing for ourselves? And, you know, unfortunately, cancer is big business. A hundred billion dollars were spent last year on cancer drugs alone. 74%, which is 74 billion, did not add a single day of life. That's incredible, isn't it? That's, uh, so I think as surgeons, we're, we constantly have to check ourselves and realize what are we doing for the patient and what are we doing for ourselves, for our own academic reputation, to get more patients, uh, to satisfy the institution. And it's a tough balance, but... Um, yeah, so, so <coughs> taking that point, and let's maybe move across to, to lung cancer treatment. Um, you've, you've written extensively on the balance between uh, lobectomy by thoracotomy and by VATS. You've even done robotics. And certainly across our side of the pond, we're actually doing a randomized study in thoracotomy versus VATS, which, which most Americans tell me we're crazy to do. But actually, when you're counseling a patient, you know, how do you uh, phrase the benefits of either approach, and what do you tell them is important? What's interesting is when I have a patient, that discussion doesn't really take center stage. The more important discussion is, hey doc, am I gonna live long enough with this cancer? The patient's focused on being cured from their cancer. It's not zero, but a small number, I'd say two to 5% will really focus on the technique of the surgery, minimally invasive, robotic, VATS, open, uh, limited thoracotomy. So, that's a little too nuanced, I think, for patients. I think most patients just want to be cured from their cancer. And we can't deny the fact that many people, including myself, have made academic reputations based on the technique of minimally invasive surgery, whether it's VATS, robotics. And in the end, does that really make a huge difference? When we looked at multiple studies from our own institution comparing VATS to thoracotomy, the differences weren't that great. And when you look in the literature, the complications that arise from VATS are frequently overlooked. I don't think on purpose. I think it's the nature of ha having these databases. And so in the past, we put out two very big papers on the benefits of VATS compared to thoracotomy. Two years later, we put out a paper on catastrophic complications of VATS lobectomy. None of those complications were in our first two papers. They were hidden in the database and you had to go look for it. Complications such as pneumonectomies for lobectomy, uh, splenectomy, um, bilobectomy when you wanted to just do a lobectomy. Now, those need to be included when you're weighing the risks and benefits of doing a VATS uh, versus an open lobectomy. 
I've heard arguments from other people that they see those complications with open thoracotomy as well. So that when you're doing thoracotomy, nobody reports those complications as well. Yeah, so, so when you come to meetings like this, A, you find people saying, I do 100%, I do 110% by VATS. And then the other thing is there's this huge, uh, you know, we've got to get the rate up. We've got to get our national rate up. I mean, mm -hmm. do you think people are going too far? Are we measuring the wrong thing? That's a good question. I, I think, you know, as doctors, we have to continuously check ourselves. I mean, that's why we took the Hippocratic Oath. And that separates us from the usual uh, people who are trying to grow a business. In medicine, yes, we're trying to grow our practice, but frequently the business of medicine is getting in the way of the, uh, uh, the people portion of medicine. And our ultimate goal is to make sure patients are taken care of in the best possible way. If you can get out a cancer with a couple small holes in someone's chest, intuitively that makes sense. If you can do that safely, do it. The problem that I've seen is that many physicians, especially many of the physicians at our meetings, will see the experts discussing these techniques. And then when they go back home, they feel, wow, I'm not doing what's in my patient's best interest. I have to push this. So then they get into a minimally invasive situation where the expert would have opened, but they don't have that insight into the case. So they push it and then they hurt the patient whether they cause massive bleeding or they have to do a pneumonectomy. And that's why as leaders in this field, we have to make sure that we're portraying the right message. And that, yes, if you can do it minimally invasively, fine. But if you are at any point unsure or you feel the patient's at an increased risk of a bad complication, open. Nowadays, our thoracotomies aren't huge. We make smaller thoracotomies, they're less painful. And the patients do just about the same as the minimally invasive ones. Now, you have to be careful because the experts in minimally invasive surgery who have made their name in minimally invasive surgery are going to promote it because that's what has helped them. And what do you think is the best you can do thoracotomy? Do you, what steps can you mm. take to, to minimize the insult to a patient? Well, I think the staplers have really helped to minimize the size of the thoracotomy incision. Uh, in the end, you had to ha in the past, you had to have good exposure because you were tying things and sewing things and you, you had to get your hands in there. Nowadays, if you make a small thoracotomy incision and you put the stapler in through a thoracoscopy port, you really don't have to make a big incision unless you get into trouble. So I think the advancement of staplers has helped us make a more uh, patient-friendly thoracotomy. And like I said, if you can do it VATS, that's great. Robotically, I think there are other issues that have to be weighed. But as far as VATS is concerned, if you can do it safely, I don't see any reason why not. And then just in the last <clears throat> couple of minutes, I'd just be interested to hear your views on one other area that I think is very controversial. I think there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of people doing a lot of surgery, maybe unnecessarily. I mean, it's, it's advanced stage lung cancer surgery. So stage 3A disease, people mm -hmm. with N2. What, what's your view on, you know, which patients are suitable for surgery and which actually aren't suitable when you've got N2 disease? That's an excellent question. Um, I think the basic issue is that we are trying to control systemic disease with a local therapy. Whenever there's N2 disease, that's something that many would argue is not curable by surgery. And many of those patients get chemo radiation. Sometimes I will do extra pleural pneumonectomies for pleural disease, which of course is pushing the envelope, which many people could argue you do it for mesothelioma and you're doing it for lung cancer. <laughs> Um, would you do that up front or you'd give chemo <clears throat> first? Then? Chemo first. I'd let them sit for six months to a year, make sure no distant disease develops. And if it looks like it's just the local disease that's progressing, I have done a number of cases where I've done extra pleural pneumonectomy for pleural dissemination when they don't have any distant disease. I don't know if that's the right thing to do. It depends on the patient. Many of the ones that come searching for that procedure, they're young, they're aggressive, they're strong. And I don't know what the right thing to do is. I don't think it's the right thing for every patient, but that goes to show you how, as physicians, we can do things that will go against what we're preaching about. 
so, uh, and would you operate up front on someone with single station N2 proven on an EBUS? Would you just say, sure, let's just get it out, or would you go systemic first? I could go either way. I have done it. I have resected on single station N2. Uh, I don't think there are right answers for those questions, but I still, I don't think that we need to state that certain things are absolutely the right way to go. And I think we need to leave room for doubt that we don't know what is the right thing for the patients and be able to be malleable in our treatment. Yeah. And then just as a final question, you know, I think we should meet up in 10 years time, really, because this has been great fun. But, you know, what do you think we'll be talking about in 10 years? What operations will we be doing for lobectomy or miso? Where do you think the specialty is going? So for mesothelioma, I think we've come full circle with pleurectomy. Back in 1939, they were doing pleurectomies. Then we tried to do something differently with extra pleural pneumonectomy, and now we're back to pleurectomy. With lung cancer, I think it's going to follow the, uh, the lead of all the other cancers. Uh, breast cancer has gone from maximal Halsted resections to lumpectomy. Uh, sarcoma of the extremity from amputation to uh, limb-preserving surgery. And I think the same thing in lung. I think we've gone from pneumonectomy back in the 50s to lobectomy, and I think we're going to continue to get smaller and smaller. Um, as far as medications are concerned, with the targeted therapies that are coming out, although none are leading to cure, I do think at some point those targeted therapies are going to help us do smaller operations on patients. And the single most important thing out there is finding it early. And I think, you know, the NLST trial showing that there is a significant difference in disease-specific mortality when you screen with CAT scan come in, uh, compared to x-ray is a big deal. And when you look at it, we screened, at least in the United States, 4% of the population before the NLST trial. Now, years after the NLST and its acceptance by CMS, we're still screening 4% of the population. So we can improve survival rates by screening. Right now, that, in my mind, is the most important thing in lung cancer. Hopefully, when we're sitting here 10 years from now, we'll have a higher cure rate because of screening. Fantastic. Well, that's amazing. Things I didn't know. We're gonna, we need to get the, the, the screening rate up. We need to ban asbestos. Two amazing <laughs> things. You'll save thousands of lives. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. So from myself, Joel Dunning, and everyone at CTSnet, I'd just like to say thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Great. Thank you.